my group works on a number of different things, in particular, um, how evolution uses a sort of multi-scale competency architecture to evolve not just uh, bodies that solve specific environments, uh, but, but machines that solve a wide class of problems, in, including novel, uh, novel ones. And in particular, we work on understanding how, uh, while DNA specifies the cellular hardware that every cell has to deploy, um, what actually can be done both by us as engineers and by evolution by working at the software level. And this uh, in involves this concept of agential materials where biology uses material with agendas in various spaces all the way down. What I will uh, focus on, since we, we don't have that much time, what I'll focus on are two things. I'll try to show you that. Um, dynamic, robust anatomical homeostasis, not just emergent morphogenesis, but actually uh, the dynamic control of a form is a kind of intelligent behavior of a cellular collective that's solving problems in anatomical morphospace. So that will be um, the uh, kind of the example that we'll work on today. There are many others. And I'm going to argue that uh, one important uh, cognitive glue that harnesses cells towards these kind of large scale anatomical outcomes is developmental bioelectricity. And we've actually <clears throat> now uh, developed tools to, and, and more importantly, starting to develop co uh, computational methods to read and write the pattern memories of uh, this organ level collective intelligence. So let's just start um, by uh, envisioning what, what the end game of, let's say, regenerative medicine might look like. What, what you'd like to do is someday to be able to uh, sit down in front of a computer and draw the large scale anatomy of the animal that you want. So in this case, it's a, th it's a three headed flatworm that looks like this. Let me show you more flatworms momentarily. If we knew what we were doing, we would have a piece of software that could compile this description into a set of stimuli that would have to be given to cells to make them build exactly this. Now, why would we need such a thing? Because all of the problems of medicine, perhaps with the exception of infectious disease, we're talking about birth defects, traumatic injury, cancer, aging, degenerative disease. All of these things would be solved if we knew uh, one simple thing, which is how do we control what it is that groups of cells are going to build? Okay, this is a so this is a very practical, um, a very practical problem, not just uh, basic science or philosophy. It's very, very practical. Now, why don't we have such a thing? We are very, very far away from this because, uh, despite all the um, progress in molecular genetics and things like that, we have really some fundamental knowledge gaps. So, simple one can be uh, can be illustrated this way. Uh, axolotls, uh, baby axolotls have legs. Um, frog larvae or tadpoles do not have legs. If I were to make a chimeric embryo, uh, let's say half axolotl cells, half frog cells, which, which we've done, which is possible. And uh, I would say, well, we have both of the genomes. We have the axolotl genome. We have the frog genome. Will the frog axolotls have legs? And if they do have legs, will those legs be made entirely of axolotl cells? Or will they in fact have some frog cells uh, making up those legs? We don't have any models that allow you to make a prediction on this. Okay, only empirically can we can we start to answer this. So even even though we have we have perfect access to the uh, to the to the genomes, and in fact, it's even worse because even from a, a single species genome, we cannot tell what the anatomy is going to be unless we sort of cheat by comparing it to another genome whose anatomy we do know. So the state of the art here is this, and we're very good at manipulating cells and molecules. Um, we are really quite a long way from understanding how to control large scale form and function. And biomedicine has been largely at the, uh, at the level of, of hardware, all the, all the focus has been on genomic editing and pathways and, and things like this. But I'm, I'm going to argue that we really, to, to move this forward, we really need to understand not just the mechanisms by which cells do things, but actually how do they know what to do, right? Especially in novel circumstances, which is, which is where the intelligence comes in. And so what I'm going to do today is show you progressively more unusual examples of what I think uh, cellular collective intelligence is doing and um, some of our attempts to understand and exploit that. So let's take a look. Let's just remind ourselves how all of us made our journey across the uh, Cartesian uh, cut here. We all started life as a single cell, which became a collection of cells, these embryonic blastomeres. And then uh, over some amount of time, they, uh, without any instructions from, from outside, they spontaneously self-assembled a creature that uh, has uh, sophisticated cognition and first-person perspective and all these things. And this is a cross-section through uh, a human torso. Look at the remarkable order here, right? The, um, the just, just, just amazing uh, invariant structure where all the tissues, organs, everything is in the right place next to the right thing. Where does that anatomical pattern come from? 
I mean, we can read genomes now and we know it's not in the DNA. DNA specifies proteins. It does not directly specify anatomy. So we have these difficult questions of how do these collections of cells know what to make, when to stop? How do we re uh, convince them to rebuild after, um, after damage? And as engineers, and this is gonna lead into um, Josh's talk next, um, we'd like to know how far can we push this actually? Could we get these same cells to build something completely different? And so now this emergent feed forward patterning process, which people a lot often think about with, in, with complexity theory and emergence, you know, lots of local rules and then out comes something, something amazing. It's actually even much more, I mean, that's amazing enough, but it's actually much more interesting than that. So, so the first thing we got to remember is that cells are extremely competent. This is a single cell creature. This is a lacrimarium. There's no brain, there's no nervous system. Um, uh, th this this, uh, this, this uh, creature handles all of its physiological, metabolic, and morphological goals at the single cell scale. If you're into soft robotics, uh, you're probably really jealous of this. We don't have anything that um, begins to uh, compare with this, with this degree of control. Again, one single cell. And so uh, we can start by, um, by thinking about uh, this. And, and so we start with this definition of intelligence that I quite like from William James which is the ability to reach the same ends by different means. Let's look at a few examples. Uh, embryogenesis is robust and reliable, but it is not hardwired. So if you take an early embryo and you cut it in half, you don't get two half embryos, you get two perfectly normal monozygotic twins. So again, we don't really have any, um, any machines that, that, that can do that. Each half recognizes what's missing, rebuilds, no problem. It even gets uh, more amazing than that because they can adapt to not only uh, injury and changes of environment, they can on the fly adapt to changes of internal components. So this is a cross section through a newt uh, kidney tubule and it looks like this and there's eight to 10 cells that work together to build this thing. If you modify the initial egg in a way that uh, produces very uh, gigantic cells, fewer and fewer cells will work together to make exactly the same diameter lumens until the cells get so big that just one cell will wrap around itself to produce exactly the same anatomical outcome. Now, this is a completely different molecular mechanism. This is cytoskeletal bending. This is cell-to-cell -cell communication. So the system harnesses diverse underlying molecular uh, component, um, uh, molecular pathways to make up for a radical change in its component parts to get the same outcome, right? So remember James's definition. Now, um, this is another phenomenon called regeneration. So you can take a, a this is an axolotl, they regenerate many parts of their body. You can uh, amputate the leg at different portions. The leg will begin to grow. It will grow exactly as much as needed from wherever it is that you cut it. And it will stop when a correct salamander leg has been produced. Right? So we need to understand this process of anatomical homeostasis. You keep, um, keep growing and keep remodeling until you get to the correct shape, and then you can stop some sort of means ends analysis, something like that. So here we have the ability in, in these examples that I'm showing you to get to the same outcome despite perturbations, despite uh, diverse starting positions. Here's a radical example of that. A few years ago, we discovered that well, in the normal journey from tadpole to frog, of course, the faces are different. They have to rearrange their face. So the eyes have to move forward. The jaws have to come out. And it was thought that because all tadpoles look the same and all frogs look the same, all you have to do is, is somehow code in what direction and how far they move. So we made the so-called Picasso tadpoles. Everything is in the wrong place. The eyes are on the side of the head. The jaws are off kilter. Everything is wrong. These animals make largely perfectly good frogs because all of this stuff will continue to move in novel uh, uh, paths. In fact, sometimes they go too far and have to double back until a correct frog face is produced and then they stop. So what the genetics actually gives us is a system that can make up for all kinds of um, errors and deviations and uh, in, in its, in its, uh, in its um, uh, uh, attempts to get to uh, the correct uh, set point, the correct target morphology. If we had a robotic swarm that could do this, we would call this an amazing example of, uh, of, of collective intelligence. So now, the thing with these set points is that um, the, 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 uh, they, can, they can grow in terms of um, very, very simple homeostatic loops like this at the single cell level can grow and become very large set points like, a, the, like the layout of a, uh, of a correct limb. Okay? So when cells join together into networks, these, these uh, um, homeostatic loops, instead of tracking a local scalars and things like pH and hunger level and so on, are actually now able to track very large things like how many fingers do I have? What is the length of the limb? But it can actually shrink down as well. This is, uh, this is um, uh, uh, a glioblastoma. So this is a cancer. And what happens is the cells from a normal organism can 
uh, detach from the network of cues that keeps them harnessed towards these large scale goals and shrink back down to these very ancient, very humble single cell goals, like proliferate as much as I can move wherever life is good. That's metastasis and cancer. So that boundary of, of the goals that these systems are able to, uh, to work towards can grow and can shrink. Now, how does this happen? How do cells scale up into larger, into networks that can maintain larger um, set points? Well, very much like in the brain, uh, they do this through bioelectricity. Long before brains and nervous systems evolved, evolution uh, discovered that electrical networks are great for processing information, storing memories, and so on. Uh, every cell in your body has what neurons has, have, which is ion channels in their membrane that allow them to store um, uh, the set of voltage uh, potentials across the membrane, and these electrical synapses that allow them to communicate these states to their neighbors with, a, with, with lots of sophistication. Both of these things are actually transistors, right? They're, they're voltage gated themselves, making for all kinds of interesting feedback loops and so on. So um, what's going on is that uh, while this, this much newer system is able to uh, use uh, these electrical circuits to control muscle movement, to move you around through three-dimensional space. And neuroscientists try to decode this uh, electrical activity to try to infer um, the, the, the mental content of what's going on here. Well, long before that, this, the same exact system was being used to control all of the cells of the embryo to move the configuration of the body in anatomical morphous space. And we are doing exactly the same thing uh, as this program of neural decoding to try to extract, and this is what you're seeing here is a, um, a video of a voltage sensitive fluorescent dye. Um, uh, this is a frog embryo. It's not a simulation. This is, this is a, real, a real embryo. You can see all the cells uh, processing these um, electrical signals that, uh, that communicate with, to each other, who's going to be head, tail, left, right, all that, all that kind of thing. So what we developed um, uh, were some tools to not only track it, but actually to manipulate this. Now, this is uh, not, we, we don't use any um, electromagnetic fields. There are no electrodes. We don't apply currents and nothing like that. What we do is we basically do what neuroscientists do, which is to manipulate the gap junctions or the topology of the network. So we get to control which cell controls with, uh, com uh, communicates with which other cell. And we can control individual ion channels using optogenetics with light, with, with drugs, with mutation. Uh, to set voltages and, in fact, uh, patterns of voltage distributions. So at the single cell level, the importance of it looks kind of like this. When we um, inject a, uh, an oncogene, a powerful oncogene, let's say a KRAS mutation from, from a human tumor into these tadpoles, they will eventually develop a tumor. But long before that, you can actually watch with these uh, um, non-invasive voltage dyes, you can actually watch the cells disconnect electrically from their neighbors. They acquire a unique, different resting potential. And now they're rolling back to this amoeba-like state where they're just going to treat the rest of the animal as external environment. They go where they want, they, uh, they eat what they want, and so on. So we can actually watch this. More importantly, we can prevent this process by co-injecting with this RNA. We co-inject RNA encoding a particular ion channel, which we've chosen to set a voltage state that will force them to remain in the electrical connection with their neighbors, no matter what the oncogene says. So if you do this, then even though that, that oncoprotein is really strongly expressed, you can see it's blazing. This is a, just a fluorescent um, uh, marker that's attached to it. It's all over the place. In fact, there doesn't have to be any tumor because the actual outcome is not in the genetics of uh, what's happening uh, to, the, to, the, to the, um, the genome of the cell. It's actually in the physiology of what that cell is going to be connected to as far and, and what that network is trying to do, in this case, maintain proper hist um, histogenesis and, and so on. So that's at the single cell level. At the multicellular level, you have uh, pre-patterns that like the electric face. We call this the electric face. Here's a frog embryo putting its uh, face together. In fact, here's one frame out of that video. And what you can see here is that long before the genes come on to pattern the face, You've all, you can already extract from this, and I'm showing you this example because it's the most obvious. Others are really um, complicated to decode. This one is the most obvious. You can basically see what's, gonna, what's going to happen. Here's where the right eye is going to happen. The left eye comes in later. Here's where uh, the mouth is going to form here with the placodes. Already, these, this, this network has this kind of internal memory of what a correct um, uh, uh, tadpole face is supposed to look like, and that is what guides gene expression and anatomy. If you mess with this, with optogenetics, with, um, with various uh, uh, drugs that open and close these channels, you can induce uh, a severe mispatterning of the, um, uh, of, of the gene expression and the anatomy. And in fact, lots of human uh, channelopathies uh, have this explanation behind them. They're basically mutations in ion channels 
that mess up the ability of these networks to remember what they're supposed to form. Now, once you start to control this, you can see that some very interesting things are possible. So for example, here, we've taken some ion channels. Now that we know what an eye specific pattern looks like, a pattern that says build an eye here, we can, we can now write that pattern into the electrical network of other cells. So we can go in and take that ion channel RNA, inject it into some cells that are going to otherwise form gut, and the cells, sure enough, they follow the, they follow the pattern and they make, a, uh, they make a nice eye. These eyes will have all the same uh, layers, retina, optic nerve, all the same stuff that eyes are supposed to have. And a couple interesting things, we can make eyes, we can make ectopic legs, as you see here. Um, two interesting things to notice. One is that this is a, a very modular phenomenon. It's basically a subroutine call. We in no way provided enough information to know how to make an eye. All we provided was a fairly simple signal that said, you already know how to build an eye, but do, do it here, right? It's a, it's a trigger. It's not micromanaging the cells. We certainly didn't specify all the cell identities and so on, right? So, so the whole thing is quite modular. We're finding these, um, these, these hooks into the uh, morphogenetic modules that it knows how to do. And, and then what you can see here, there's two level of instruction. The blue is, th this is a lens sitting out in the tail of a tadpole somewhere that we've induced. Uh, the, the blue cells are the ones we actually injected with an ion channel that says uh, build an eye here. These cells back here, we didn't touch them at all. They were recruited by these cells that uh, in some way basically organized the right number of cells to build a proper lens because we didn't inject an eye. So we instruct these cells they're going to make an eye. These cells instruct some of their neighbors that, hey, you need to participate in this. We're going to make this, we're going to make this eye. So there's several levels of instruction uh, here when we induce these organs. Now, one of the most um, sort of high resolution uh, uh, work that we've been able to do is concerns fixing brain defects. So this is the bioelectric pattern that is responsible for setting the shape and the size of the early brain. Okay, and it has a very, I don't, don't have time to go into all the details, but it's a very particular um, bioelectric profile if you measure it in a particular place. And what we did was, and this is in uh, collaboration with Alexis Pytak in our center, what we did was we made a computational model using a bioelectric simulator that uh, she produced that took uh, the, the situation of uh, being exposed to teratogens, for example, nicotine, alcohol, lots of different teratogens. And we built a model and we asked, okay, if the bioelectric pre-pattern is, 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 is messed up by these, uh, by these teratogens, what would we have to do to get it back? Okay, which channels could you open and close to get the correct bioelectric pattern back? One of the things that the model allowed us to do is to focus on the need for a contrast enhancer. Basically what happens in these disorders is that this, this very nice bell curve <clears throat> gets flattened either, either up here or down here. It doesn't matter which direction. Once it gets flattened like this, then, then the, brain, the, the, the cells have no idea where the edges of the brain should be and the whole thing becomes a mess. So what we need is a contrast enhancer. We need something that is, is a context sensitive, like a, almost like a sharpened filter that's going to keep this part down, but raise up this part. And our computational model <clears throat> basically told us there is such a thing. Um, it's called the HCN2 uh, ion channel. And, and remarkably, when we tried this, and you can try two different things, you can either inject new HCN2 channels into the animal, or you can use drugs to open the native HCN2 channels. Then you see something like this. This is a normal frog brain. You can see forebrain, midbrain, hindbrain. This is an animal that was uh, that that is expressing a mutant of a very important neurogenesis gene called Notch. So you can see the forebrain is basically gone. The midbrain and hindbrain are a bubble. This is a severe brain defect. They have no behavior, no learning, nothing. What you can do on top of that mutation, you can uh, introduce these uh, these ion channel, these HCN2 channels, or in fact drugs that open these channels, and you can, you can basically rescue, this, uh, rescue this, this phenotype. They have a normal brain, they have normal gene expression, and their IQs are indi um, uh, indistinguishable from controls, meaning they, their learning rates are, are absolutely back to normal. So what we're seeing here is the ability to use uh, uh, our, our predictive understanding of what the bioelectrical circuits are doing to, uh, to, in to induce large-scale changes in growth and form uh, on a background of genetics that might have uh, carcinogenic mutations, it might have uh, mutations that normally call birth defects, cause birth defects. The, 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 the bioelectric software, the, the dynamics of these circuits is what actually calls the shots in the end. And I want to show you um, one, of the, one of the most um, amazing examples, which has to do with these planaria. These are flatworms. Um, they regenerate every part of their body. If you cut them into pieces, the record is something like 275 pieces. Um, what you can do is you can amputate the head and the tail. And you can convince yourself that the anterior always has this uh, head, uh, head marker expressed, the posterior does not, fine. And uh, what they will do with, with basically 100% reliability, 
is they will uh, regenerate. And so this middle trunk fragment will give rise to a normal head, one head, one tail. Now you can do the same thing here, um, one head, one tail, um, gene expression normal. This one gives rise to a two-headed animal. This is not Photoshop, these are real. Now, why would that be if I just told you that this is 100% uh, um, consistent? That's because in the meantime, prior to cutting, what we did was we altered the bioelectric pattern that is stably stored by, the, by this tissue to remember how many heads a planarian is supposed to have. So this is the normal wild type pattern. This, and it's, of course, it's, it's pretty messy still. We're still working out the technology. But you can see here that what we've done is we've actually um, uh, basically incepted a pattern here that says, no, a normal planarian has two heads. Now, this is a really critical part. This map, this voltage map, is not a map of this two-headed creature. This voltage map is a map of this guy, meaning that the, the bioelectrics doesn't reflect what the anatomy is doing. The bioelectrics is a completely separate layer, and a single-headed, normal, anatomically normal worm can have one of two possible uh, representations internally stored in this electrical circuit of what a correct planarian looks like in case it gets injured, what is it going to do? Okay, so this is um, this is basically a, a primitive evolutionary version of a counterfactual memory. This animal uh, stores information for what it's going to do if a particular uh, scenario comes up, and we can rewrite that. So this is a neuroscience. This would be equivalent to um, incepting false memories into mouse brains with optogenetics and so on. So the, so so no doubt we no doubt there are more than two states that can be put in. This, this is just two that we've we've nailed down so far. So what we're doing now is trying to really understand how we can take the state space of these electrical circuits that make one heads, two heads, no heads, and unify them with formalisms that exist, let's say in, in connectionist architectures, other, other, types of, um, other types of formalisms to really understand uh, how it is that that electrical circuit stores memories in this, in this sense, okay? Memories that can do pattern completion, such that when part of it is gone, and memories that can be rewritten. Now, why do I keep calling this thing a memory? I mean, let's just think about this. If you had this, this two-headed worm, what would happen if we cut them again in plain water, no more drugs of any kind, just plain, plain old water? Uh, well, the standard paradigm says after you've cut off the primary head and this crazy ectopic secondary head, the genetics are untouched. We haven't done any genomic editing. The genome is still wild type. In plain old water, then this should go back to normal. Now, liberated from, from, from this uh, ectopic uh, tissue and the genetics are normal, it should just go back to, uh, back to a single-headed worm. But one interesting thing is that this kind, of, this kind of circuit that dictates this actually has two stable points, one at the single head, one at the double head state. And in fact, when you do cut them, and by the way, we did this experiment years before we understood anything about this. So this, this was, you know, we, we, saw, this, we saw this first. Um, something amazing happens. Uh, they are permanently two-headed. So you can keep cutting them. And with no further manipulation, these middle fragments continue to give rise to two-headed animals. Now, we also know how to set it back. So there's a different um, ion channel modulator that, we'll, that we now know can, can set them back to one-headed. Here are, here are the videos. The first time I, I showed this at a meeting, um, and somebody stood up and said, that's impossible. Those animals can't exist. So I, I bring this movie so you guys can see what um, two-headed uh, worms do in their, in their uh, free time. Um, but... So this, is, this has all the basic properties of memory, right? It's long-term stable. It's rewritable. It has conditional recall, as I've shown you a minute ago. If you don't cut it, it's basically ignored. It's like a latent memory. It has discrete possible behaviors. And the answer to the question of how many heads should a planarian have, which is very important because when the cells are building, that's the answer to when are they going to stop and what are they going to do, is not entirely determined by the genetics. It's information that is, the genetics certainly gives you a machine that has a default uh, electrical pattern, but but it's rewritable, okay, and it, and 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 we, and we can we can alter it on the fly. Now, what's what the challenge, of course, is now is to build models of these things, uh, and this is what we're doing that are uh, that that show the scaling. So we start with a, a gene regulatory network that tells us which channels are expressed in every cell. Then you build a from that you assemble a tissue model in the simulator where every cell runs this electrical circuit, and then you say, well, why is it that it has certain properties over the tissue scale. And then eventually you want to get to large scale uh, models that are algorithmic in, um, in, their, in their nature, meaning that they are uh, basically you build up from the, from the physics and from the behavior of these electrical circuits, you can build up uh, basically counting and logic circuits where you can see it's a human understandable way of saying, here's why they make the decisions they make. More importantly, what would we do if we wanted them to make different decisions? And so we've just started, I don't have time to go into it all, but, but we've just started using machine learning tools. And here are some, some software 
that are, are available to everybody. Um, we've started making uh, these, these machine learning tools to infer the circuits that are responsible for behaviors that we see. And then once you've done that, infer interventions, the rare uh, interventions that can be used to, to push those circuits to complex outcomes. Now, what I've shown you a minute ago is that uh, we can, for example, convince these planaria to make um, multiple heads, but it's actually even better than that. What you can do is cause them to make heads that belong to other species of planaria, 100, 100 million years distant. So if you amputate the head of this uh, triangular um, animal, you can, um, it will, and you, and you prevent the, the cells from talking to each other electrically for about 48 hours, they will make flat heads like this P. felina or uh, round heads like this S. mediterranea. And not only do they make uh, head shapes, but brain shapes exactly like these other species and distributions of stem cells. So there are, in this morphous space, there are other attractors that normally are occupied by other species, but, but, but individuals in, like this with a, with, a, with a wild type genome can be pushed into that region of, 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 of morphous space. Uh, in fact, so, so, so they land there when they can't get their, get their network to function properly. In fact, you can do this with, um, you, can, you can get them to, to, to occupy regions of that morphous space that, that are not used for planaria at all. So these weird spiky forms or these three-dimensional things, you know, flatworms don't even need to be flat. So we are, of course, using all this in regenerative medicine applications. So here's um, one of our projects to induce limb regeneration. Frogs, unlike salamanders, don't regenerate their limbs. So you amputate the leg, um, 48 hour, uh, 45 days later, nothing happens. 24 hours of, of uh, manipulation of the ion channels, and then you can get a year and a half of leg growth, basically, where you can see this is a very early time point. You can see a toenail, you can see some toes, and the leg is touch sensitive and motile. So, so we're really trying to understand what are the subroutines that are there, what do they measure, how do they make decisions, and how do we uh, uh, shift these, these circuits. But the, but the idea is that we were trying to understand the collective intelligence, not how individual cells uh, decide to be skin or muscle or something else, but how does the collective decide we're going to make a scar or a leg or a tumor or an eye or, or, or what. So um, I'm just going to um, close up here with, uh, with, with two more slides um, introducing the, the next talk, which is this. You know, we've talked about this definition of intelligence, right? But actually, one can go beyond this and say, okay, um, the same ends, but di by different means, but what other ends can cells pursue? What other problem spaces can they solve? And actually, where do these uh, set points come from? Where does the target morphology actually come from? And um, I'll just show you one direction that we've gone in, which is to ask, can cells that are taken away from their normal instructive microenvironment, specifically skin cells, reboot their multicellularity, what would they do? What, what is the baseline of what these skin cells want to do if you didn't have a bunch of other cells telling them to be this, to have this very boring two-dimensional um, life on the surface of the animal keeping out bacteria? What would this new swarm agent um, decide to do? And so for this, um, we've made uh, this, uh, this new platform, which we call Xenobots for Xenopus lavis. That's the name of the, the frog. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of proto, a novel proto-organism where, and, and Josh will, will tell you um, all about it, but basically with the exact same genome, which has normally this developmental sequence and then some, some tadpole behaviors, you can take those skin cells, they make something that looks like this. Here, here it is uh, exhibiting some, some other kinds of behaviors. They run around, they do various things. It has a very different developmental sequence. It doesn't look anything like a tadpole. Um, and it didn't have eons of selection to be a great xenobot, okay? And, and these have the exact same frog genome. So this raises all kinds of questions about what, what um, uh, what 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 uh, kinds of uh, kinds of things can collective uh, collective cellular intelligences do when placed in a novel environment? Within forty eight hours, this thing organizes itself into a new creature that's never existed to our knowledge, never existed on Earth before. So I'll stop there. Um, I want to thank uh, the postdocs and students who did all the work, um, our collaborators, um, uh, of course, our, our our funders, and the two company disclosures that I have to do one on uh, regeneration, which is more pharmaceuticals, and one about the xenobots. And um, thank you very much. I'll take questions.